everybody, thank you for joining today's web seminar, uh, Improve Kubernetes Security, Efficiency and Reliability, Introducing Fairwinds Insights. Today's featured presenters are Bill Lettingham, who is the CEO of Fairwinds. Bill has over 30 years of experience in enterprise software and technology, serving as an executive, advisor, um, investor, and co-founder of three startups. He has experience in open source software, application and security data, machine learning, visualization, high availability, DevOps, and SaaS. Our second presenter is Joe Pelletier. He's a VP of products, and he heads up products and strategy at Fairwinds. He's passionate about building great teams and solutions that bridge the gap between developers, security, and operations. As a reminder, today's session is going to be in listen-only mode. If you do have a question, please submit it in the lower Q&A tab of your screen. We'll queue them up and answer them toward the end. Now I'd like to turn things over to Bill. Thanks, Dave. Um, good afternoon, good morning, and uh, thank you very much for uh, joining us today. Uh, before jumping in, I thought it might be helpful to give a little bit of the background and motiv motivation behind Insights. Uh, prior to joining Fairwinds, I was the CTO and head of engineering at Black Duck and Synopsys, uh, the leader in the application security testing market. Uh, while at Synopsys and Black Duck, uh, I led the uh, development of a new SaaS offering whereby we went and re-architected our software to run as microservices in containers. Initially, we were using Docker Swarm for our container orchestration platform. And then we made the decision to move to Kubernetes because of all the benefits that it offers. Um, once we got there on top of Kubernetes in production, uh, we were very happy uh, that we were there. However, uh, I got to admit the, uh, the, uh, the path along the way certainly had its challenges. Uh, we didn't have a lot of in-house expertise at the time around containers and Kubernetes. So we had to go out and hire a team of DevOps engineers. And it was very difficult to find the right skills in the marketplace. Uh, as we assembled the so software stack on top of uh, Kubernetes, we went through uh, a lot of challenges in terms of identifying the right software to use, went through a lot of POCs, a lot of trial and error, before we got to the point where we felt we had a production environment ready to go. Uh, and in, in addition, kind of the ongoing handoff process between development and operations uh, as new uh, versions of the software were released, uh, we all, you know, we constantly had to kind of manage that process correctly to make sure that we weren't uh, uh, injecting misconfigurations in, in the containers and having problems result then in the production environment as those containers were deployed. So, you know, given my own experiences and uh, uh, journey to Kubernetes, I'm very pleased to be able to announce the uh, uh, GA of Insights. Uh, Fairwinds Insights really represents the culmination of a lot of great effort by our product and development teams over the past year. Um, it certainly embodies a lot of the expertise and best practices that our SREs have gleaned from deploying and managing hundreds of uh, uh, Kubernetes clusters for our customers. At a high level, really, the goal of Insights is to help dev and ops teams answer the question, am I doing this right? I.e., are my containers and Kubernetes infrastructure configured correctly for security, uh, reliability, and ongoing resource efficiency? Uh, so with that background, I'd now like to turn it over to Joe, who will take you through some of the details and provide a demonstration of insights. Joe. Awesome. Thanks, Bill. So as Bill mentioned, you know, containers are a really powerful way to get to market faster with your software investment. And as a result of, you know, leveraging containers in your environment, it really changes the way software is developed. So, you know, speaking to some of the points that Bill made, we are seeing this as not only a, you know, a big sea change in terms of how development's occurring, 
but also some of the technical considerations and organizational considerations around how you manage containers. And the first thing to know is, you know, software packaging is shifting left. Developers are taking more and more responsibility for the infrastructure by containerizing their applications. And this may also mean that they're uh, taking responsibility for parts of the Kubernetes configuration as well. Bill discussed some of the challenges that he had experienced and how a lot of those uh, difficulties around ensuring configuration you know, manifested in, in a real world scenario. The second is around the overall container adoption in the market. You know, Gartner is predicting that by 2023, 70% uh, of enterprises are going to be running containers, and that's up from 20% last year. And finally, uh, Kubernetes itself as a technology is starting to enter the mainstream. And through our own research, we're finding that this is actually occurring in enterprises through the development function. These are development teams who want to get to market faster, address customer challenges, and when they start a new project, they're looking at cloud native solutions like containers and Kubernetes as that starting point. But when you end up adopting any new technology, there's always going to be challenges. Bill obviously went through a lot of these key challenges and you know, had to learn along the way how to address them. And that's you know, exactly why we're here today. So the CNCF survey uh, in 2019 actually uh, surveyed uh, users of Kubernetes and they found that there's three challenges. First, there's a cultural shift that's involved. And this cultural shift means that the way developers and DevOps work together, uh, it has to change in order to adapt to the technology. The second is security. Security is always in a catch up position when it comes to these new technologies because they have to be able to figure out what's the risk profile how do you secure and gain visibility? And we're really in that stage right now with containers and Kube. And the third is complexity. And the complexity can really be uh, measured in terms of both technical complexity. There's, you know, Bill mentioned how it's really hard to hire uh, Kubernetes talent in the market today, and as well as organizational complexity. How do you meet the needs of, of all the different constituent, uh, constituents around this? So let's kind of double click into the first angle here, which is the cultural shift. And, the, and that's really the changes to the development pipeline. And so anytime you're adopting a new technology, something's gonna change about someone's day-to-day -day role. And what we have found is that organizationally, the responsibilities of developers and DevOps engineers can vary depending on the maturity of their Kubernetes infrastructure and, and container adoption. Developers might be uh, having responsibilities around containerizing their app, and in some cases, they may also be responsible for that deployment configuration. While DevOps engineers need to concern themselves with understanding how the core Kubernetes infrastructure works, finding the right software to manage ingress, DNS, certificate management, and understanding as well how to configure all of that to work together. And along the way here, there are different challenges that can emerge. So we know that with a developer, their key job is to write code. They have to build features, ship roadmap, and when it comes to containers and Kubernetes, they're, they're probably gonna do the least amount and focus the least amount of their time on those things just so that they can move fast and get things out the door. And oftentimes, uh, that may mean misconfigurations or ignoring certain uh, issues like known vulnerabilities inside containers. At the same time, uh, the configuration for Kubernetes is, can be fairly complex and requires a learning curve. And that's where different challenges around uh, the security of your configurations can come into play, as well as uh, efficiency settings that ensure that you're using just the right amount of compute so that you're not overspending on your cloud or under uh, provisioning resources on your applications and thus starving them in, in production. And finally, the other area of uh, potential misconfiguration or maintenance is around the patching and upgrading of the different add-ons that are needed to run core Kubernetes services. And so these are multifaceted problems that affect primarily security, but from what we can see, the efficiency of how applications run in production as well. And we all know that security wants to get visibility across the whole pipeline. And so having to, how you manage that relationship and how you manage those requirements becomes really important. And that's really where the complexity comes into play. You know, the complexity of Kubernetes is it's pretty uh, known and 
a lot of folks in the, in the market talk about how Kubernetes is a steep learning curve, and we know that. And I think over time, it will get easier to learn. But how you deal with the different requirements and requests from different stakeholders becomes another key challenge here. If you're the developer, you don't want to spend that much time on having to learn how to configure Kube just to get your app to run. But if you're the SRE, you also want to make sure you're not going to have apps that end up failing or crashing in production and keeping the pager up, uh, keeping the pager running. And finally, security teams, they're always looking for visibility to understand what are the uh, critical risks that we need to be cognizant of, while at the same time that VPE is focused on how do we balance security and scale and growth requirements so that we can you know, meet the next uh, needs of the business. So there are definitely great tools today that help with different parts of managing Kube, but they don't each of these tools still have a key missing piece. If we think about the monitoring tools that are, exist in the market, they're very important because they help you react to CPU, memory, and just production metrics. But they lack visibility into these configuration risks that we illustrated just a few minutes ago. And the managed Kubernetes services, they're great to get up and running quickly, but it really still requires expertise and a long tail of effort in order to maintain those environments and a lot of best practices are not included with those services. And finally, there's also a great number of open source tools out in the market today that are focusing on very specific problems here. The whole Kubernetes ecosystem is built around open source, but when you have to scale and operationalize those tools, it, it requires a significant amount of engineering time and resources. And so making that investment can be difficult. And so that's why we built Fairwinds Insights. We built it to be a configuration validation platform, and we want to help customers protect and optimize their mission-critical Kubernetes apps. And so the way we do that is we integrate some of these trusted open source tools that we've gone out and built ourselves at Fairwinds and that we've integrated from third-party open source providers. And we've wrapped it with collaboration workflows. We provide support and expertise, and we focus on that handoff where there's organizational complexity between development, security, and operations. And the best thing about Fairwinds Insights is it's built on five plus years of DevOps and containers and Kubernetes expertise. Our team today manages infrastructure for hundreds of deployments. And with all that expertise, we've been able to turn it into valuable open source tools and best practices that we've made part of the Fairwinds Insights platform. And so to give you a flavor of what that looks like, and, and we'll see some of this in the demo, We've gone out, curated some of the best tools, and we cover uh, a, a four different key areas. We cover container scanning. We cover deployment validation with our own tooling uh, called Polaris. We do vulnerability management, and we integrate uh, a few different tools around that, as well as workload optimization. And workload optimization is one that leverages our Goldilocks uh, tooling, but adds additional uh, layers of of insight so that you can uh, optimize the CPU and memory settings of your Kubernetes apps. And, and on top of that, we also take the data and recommendations from insights and we help get them into the tools that teams are using every day. So that might be Slack, it might be Datadog, it might be any of the other ticketing or CI CD tools that you are familiar with. And once we integrate all those tools, which you'll see here on the left, we make sure that we spend time aggregating, deduplicating, uh, prioritizing all that data and enriching it with remediation guidance so that we can integrate them into those downstream systems. So I'm gonna to switch to the demo here in just a second, but in the demo, I'm gonna uh, show you some of the, the key considerations that uh, our configuration validation platform focuses on. And first that's around containers themselves making sure that we're helping you vet the security of those containers. The second is, an, is a sort of a new area around deployment configurations. And deployment configurations are, are critical because in order for you to run those containers in Kubernetes, you need to make sure that the way that they're configured to run are both secure and address efficiency issues. And finally, we're gonna address the overall Kubernetes infrastructure, uh, show you some of the key areas where SREs and DevOps engineers need to be able to manage security and efficiency and, and manage that important balance. And so we'll go ahead and switch to the demo here in just a second.
All right. So here we're at the, the sign up page for Fairwinds Insights. And this is located at insights.fairwinds.com if you're interested. But once you sign up, the first thing you'll do is land into our, uh, the logged in interface here where you'll have an opportunity to start adding a cluster. Before I go into that, there's some interesting things I wanna highlight around uh, Fairwinds Insights. So first, we're a SaaS platform, which means that you can add an unlimited number of users from your organization to the SaaS platform. And here, I've, I just have added myself, but I may, in this case, add a security manager, I may add my VPE, I may add members of my DevOps and SRE team so that we can all have that single pane of glass and in, in visibility. I'll also wanna be able to take advantage of integrations with the tools that I use, such as Slack. So my team is always on Slack. We're always getting updates from different systems about alerts. Um, I wanna stay on top of whether or not configurations that are being pushed into my environment have any issues. And the same thing is with Datadog. I may wanna make sure that the data from Insights is overlaid with the data from Datadog so that we can uh, be able to correlate things in real time. But really one of the first steps is going to be adding a new cluster or just attaching your cluster to the Fairwinds Insights interface. And I've already done this here. When I go to do that, the first thing I'm gonna to have to do is install the Fairwinds Insights Helm chart. And this Helm chart is actually a curated Helm chart of open source tools from Fairwinds, uh, from trusted third parties, as well as a few uh, tools that we have also built here at Fairwinds that focus on uh, finding risky RBAC profiles and monitoring your add-on releases. And so we'll give you an option to integrate those tools, set them up to run on a schedule, which we have by on an hourly schedule, so that you can continuously monitor your environment for various different risks. And the install is very quick. You can just go ahead and install that, that Helm chart and within uh, two to three minutes, you'll start seeing that all of these tools will be reporting back data. Now, one of the key challenges here around open source tools in the Kubernetes ecosystem is, you know, the advantage is that they're powerful and they're focused on really important problems, but they each report back their own uh, findings in different formats. And so, in reality, you need to use a number of these tools to really get good visibility into your environment but to spend the effort to operationalize all these tools by normalizing the data, deduplicating findings, tracking the findings over time, and then making sure you have the remediation guidance so that you know how to fix the issues, that's where it becomes really problematic. And uh, with Insights, we take care of all of that heavy lifting for you. So we can see that I've been getting some data here from the past uh, you know, 45 minutes or so. All of that data has been ingested into the platform and immediately we're getting a high level summary of, of different areas that I need to focus on. So by default uh, with Fairwinds, we're going to be focusing on uh, three different categories of priorities. We're gonna focus on security findings, efficiency findings and reliability findings. And the color coding gives us a sense of what is potentially dangerous or critical that we need to address versus what are warning issues that we need to be focused on separately. So the first kind of section I'm gonna uh, dig into here is some of the security issues. And we can see that there's actually a, a number of security findings from the latest uh, report here on Insights. Uh, we you know, first have been able to categorize these issues um, you know, from danger to warning. And we can uh, see that it, it's all following under the category of security and we, we can see what's system has reported that back. But some of the other important uh, information that we also gather is when was the first time we saw that issue and when was the last time we saw it? So this is really important because every time you try to do an audit of your, your configurations, you want to make sure you're not introducing the same information uh, or the same checks, you know, the last time. And so we keep a track of this, um, you know, just inherently as part of the platform. And that gives me an opportunity to assign it out to an engineer or also um, select a resolution that allows me to just close out the issue if I don't think it is a, a problem that we need to fix right now. Uh, but in, in this case, I'm gonna first focus on a couple uh, container findings. 
And uh, when I go ahead and open up one of these container findings, I'll see that there's actually a variety of different issues here. Um, I'll see the package name, the vulnerabilities that uh, are, the vulnerability CVE IDs that are included, as well as the severity. And that gives me a quick way to assess where do I need to focus on uh, resolving any sort of open container challenges. The second is going to be one around, and this is a, pop, a common one, is around the deployment configuration of the cluster, of the, config, of the, the, the deployment configuration of the application, excuse me. And in this one, we can see that the application here is actually designed to run as root. Now, uh, generally speaking, this is a, a setting that you may want to try to avoid uh, setting for your app. And if I'm a developer and I'm trying to get my app out to Kube, I might actually tell the application to run as root because it's the fastest way for me to just avoid any sort of problems around permission, permissioning or et cetera. But setting it as root actually introduces some unnecessary risk, especially if the application doesn't need that level of access. And so a common um, misconfiguration that can be overlooked is um, here, and we've been able to surface this up right now around my, my application. Um, uh, finally, the other one I want to kind of highlight is around the Kubernetes cluster itself, and that's a, a popular one around version disclosure. So when it comes to the actual cluster design, the, the kubelet that run on the node can sometimes be uh, enabled with debugging flags, et cetera. And this is where we want to make sure that we've set up the, the cluster in such a way that we're not leaking information like versions. Um, as well as we're not exposing uh, pod information as well. And so that's where uh, some additional uh, you know, security hardening can come into place. Now, we, we had just a, looked at a, a variety of security issues that cover containers, configuration, and, and clusters. Let's take a look at some of the efficiency findings from Insights. So when I click into this, I'm gonna see that I have actually a few different issues here. One is uh, some of the memory settings for my application are actually too high. And that's kind of interesting because when I set my memory too high, it means that I might actually be giving more compute resources to this app than it needs. And ultimately that can incur either additional cloud cost or it could mean I'm taking up capacity in a fixed data center. And so, this is a key consideration, especially for cost conscious uh, customers. And we'll, we'll share more about this in a second. The other ones are around the fact that uh, CPU and memory limit, limits are not even set. Now it's one issue to have them as too high because that means again, you might be giving too much resource to that app. It's a completely other issue if you don't have the actual limits set. And what this means is you're relying on Kubernetes to kind of figure out how much resource should I be using. Uh, and again, this can cause a lot of different types of problems, uh, also leading to uh, overconsumption of compute. And to address this issue, we actually provide some you know, YAML snippets that an engineer can use to quickly add some of these limits in place and, and close out the finding. Now, the third category is around reliability. And a lot of these issues are usually around the fact that health checks are not implemented. So Kubernetes uses two types of health checks. One is called a readiness probe, which is designed to ensure that the application has reached a ready state. And that ready state uh, means that it's ready to receive traffic. The other one is around liveness probes. And this is designed to ensure that the application stays in a healthy state. And so if this probe is not set or if it fails, uh, I'm sorry, if this probe uh, fails, then the pod will restart. But if you don't have these things set, it can actually lead to reliability issues in production when there are failures or there are anomalies and Kubernetes is unable to actually uh, restart the application. And so that's where uh, it's important to set these uh, settings. And again, we provide some of that uh, YAML level snippets for engineers to use and work with. So hopefully this gives you a flavor of the types of issues that you know may may occur uh, or may be found in a Kubernetes environment. Um, you know, there's a lot of data here, and we realize that, and that's why we focus on helping you prioritize and sort through the findings through a, a number of different lenses. But sometimes you might be working with just a single application team. You may not be concerned with everything that's in the cluster. You may be just in a moment where I have to work with 
um, the, the payments group in order to make sure that that payments application is configured correctly. And this is where our workloads uh, view gives a really focused level of information. The first thing that you're gonna see in the workloads view is our estimated cost of this workload on a, on a monthly basis. But you're also gonna see information on where, uh, based on the usage that we've seen of the application in the running environment, uh, whether or not you have provisioned too much or too little memory in CPU. And so Fairwinds will, will make recommendations around how much CPU you should be using or how much memory you should be using based on that actual usage. We also uh, make it really convenient for the engineer or the lead developer on that app to see very specifically what they need to focus on. So instead of looking at all the issues you know, the dozens of issues I showed on the previous screen, we're keeping it very focused here so that a single engineer can just say, all right, I know what my task list is, I'm gonna focus on this and then move on. Uh, there's a couple other things I wanna share and these are really important for what I would call the platform engineering team. And uh, typically the platform engineering team is responsible for the base infrastructure. Right? They want to make sure that they're building a great platform for development teams to deploy to, and they're going to concern themselves with some of the core add-ons in that environment, as well as the RBAC uh, uh, profiles. So in this first view, we're going to keep, first keep track of what are the different add-ons that are running in this cluster. Now, I have a very small cluster because it's just for demo purposes, but in reality, we've seen customers with you know, several rows of, of information here that relate to cert manager, DNS, ingress controllers, you name it. And they need to keep track of what the version is running and whether if a new version is available for upgrade. So we automatically keep track of that for folks who are using Helm 3. And uh, that's an easy way for a platform engineer to stay on top of, am I running the right versions and the correct versions of the software that uh, is needed for my cluster. And the other dimension here is really around RBAC. And so, you know, role-based access control. Uh, one of the things that we've found for a platform engineer is that they're gonna have to be, you know, looking across all the different RBAC profiles that they've set up for a cluster. And uh, they, need to, they need to know that information because it's both important from a security perspective, but also compliance requirements often mean you have to audit and keep on, tr keep on top of your RBAC settings. So what we do is we flag what we consider potentially risky RBAC profiles. It doesn't mean that these RBAC profiles are incorrect. It just means you probably want to take a second look at them. And those are the ones with the warning sign. What these RBAC profiles mean are uh, they are designed for that they can edit other RBAC profiles. And so that's where it's important just to make sure, am I supposed to have that permission for this or uh, should I be you know, reevaluating re that? And our help center provides some great information on how you should think about this. Um, so wanted to make sure folks had, got to see that as well. Oops. There we go. So that covers a, a pretty large swath of the Fairwinds Insights interface. But the last thing I do want to share is uh, a feature that uh, we have as part of our uh, cluster ops managed service. So Fairwinds, you know, manages uh, hundreds of deployments for customers today. And as part of that service, we're staying on top of different announcements about the Kubernetes uh, ecosystem, whether it's security risks or other advisories. And uh, as part of Insights, we're also channeling this information into the platform. So any Insights customers can get that, that same report and research from the uh, Fairwinds SRE team available in the product as well. And so with, with that said, I'm gonna go and just switch back to the slides here for a minute. And uh, I wanna just thank the audience for a lot of the, uh, the time today. I wanna make sure you uh, know about our free trial available at fairwinds.com slash insights. And I think with that, Dave, I'll turn it over to you for any questions that you've been able to collect. Sure, so at this time, if you do have a question, please submit it through the Q&A tab in the lower portion of your screen. I do have a few questions that have been queued up during the session. 
The first one is, um, does Fairwinds plan to add any additional open source tools to Insights? Yeah, that's actually a great question. Um, so we do. So we've started out with adding about five or six tools that uh, I shared uh, today, but we are also planning to add additional tools um, as we uh, both innovate. So we, we have developed some recent tools, uh, one of them called Pluto. We're planning to add that into our uh, platform. It looks for uh, deprecated APIs. Uh, and we're also continuing to focus in the areas of security, efficiency, and reliability. And so as we um, learn and understand the best of breed tools there, we plan to um, uh, integrate them as well. Now, some of the other things that we do is we're also uh, trying to enable the community to build their own integrations. So uh, we have uh, published or we are planning to publish very soon some information on how you can integrate uh, your open source tools into Insights and get that same value of all that aggregated information, normalized, deduplicated, and, and available in the interface. Excellent. So next question I have is, um, does Insights integrate into any CI CD tools? That's a great question. Um, right now, we uh, natively integrate into the cluster. That's sort of the, the lowest common denominator, if you will, in terms of where we integrate. Uh, a lot of companies start by running our tools in their staging cluster. But we are moving forward with plans to do CI CD integration. Uh, there's a number of different types of uh, tools that can also run well earlier in the development process. Things like container scanning or uh, deployment configuration um, and inspecting different uh, uh, YAML files, et cetera. So we are looking at what are the tools that make sense to integrate early, especially when developers and DevOps engineers need that rapid feedback. And those are things that um, we look forward to uh, you know, sharing in, in the roadmap. Okay, it looks like I have just one more question. So just a final reminder, if you do have a question, to submit it through the Q&A tab. And it's, um, does Insights offer an on-premise version? Yeah, great question. We, we do get this from time to time. Um, what I shared today was via our software as a service platform. Uh, we do have self-hosted options. Um, we're happy to talk uh, about uh, more about what that is uh, with our sales team. And uh, they're designed to run either in your on-premise data center or you can self-host it in a uh, in your cloud environment. So it's a pretty flexible system, and we're open to those uh, discussions if anyone has interest there. Excellent. So um, at this time, I don't see any further questions. I just want to thank Joe and Bill for a um, great presentation. We are recording today's session. We're going to make sure we share a link with everybody that registers and attends, and we'll also make sure we include a link to go ahead and sign up for a free trial. So thanks very much, everybody, for taking the time to join us today. Bill or Joe, any final comments before we wrap up? No, just uh, thanks once again for joining us and uh, look forward to hearing your feedback and, and going from there. So thank you. Yep. Thanks, for, thanks again, and thank you for the questions. Great. That'll conclude today's session.